Mr. Dan Itza, playing Mr. Madison. We are here at the Constitutional Day event for the Heritage National Heritage National Heritage Center for Constitutional Studies. Say and I want to say thank you very fast. much for spending a few minutes with Granite Rock. And as always, it is my honor. Thank you. I got a couple questions for you, especially in this day where we always seem to see words bandied about, and I think wrongfully. So the first question I'm going to, I only have two questions for you. This is a short interview. But then I'll ask you about your book, too. Um, the first question is, what is the difference between an entitlement, a privilege, and a right, according to the Constitution? Well, first of all, I would say that under the, well, under the Constitution, I, you don't see the word entitlement at all. So let's start with rights and privileges. Um, rights, under the understanding of our founders, are natural rights. They are, uh, uh, they are, that you have them by virtue of your existence. Uh, those of us in faith, of faith, in, uh, attributing them to our creator. Uh, they are uh, a gift of God. We have them because, because we are. Uh, natural rights are those rights which you would have if you were standing out in the forest and there were no government. So, do you have the right to protect yourself? Of course. Do you have the right to say whatever you would like to say? Do you have the right to worship that God however you would worship him? Those are, na are perfect examples of natural rights. Then you have a whole other class of rights which are, which are considered privileges in our Constitution. Those privileges in, uh, are the rights you have, the civil rights you have, that are a consequence of there being a government, such as voting or uh, the, uh, the right to a speedy trial. You can't have a trial without a government, right? So that's, that can't be a natural right. Um, if you look at the Constitution of New Hampshire, it generally treats natural rights up front and then goes on to a series of privileges uh, and uh, the privileges and immunities that, you know, prohibitions on, uh, you can't be arrested without a warrant. Well, without a government, you can't be arrested at all. So that's not a natural right. That's, that's a, uh, a civil right or a, an immunity. Okay. That's, that's the, there are no entitlements because uh, under the view of our founders, no one was entitled to something belong, belonging to another person anyway. So how could you be entitled to something? The only thing you might be entitled to is uh, that which you earned yourself. Okay. Um, given that, I want to read read you a very short paragraph. It was said this week by a constitutional lecturer. Mm. Our constitution reflects the values we cherish as a people and the ideals we strive for as a society. It secures the privileges we enjoy as citizens, but also demands participation, responsibility, and service to our country and to one another. Now, from a strictly U.S. constitutional basis, what do you make of that? It, does that ring true? Does it, is it sort of you know, non-consequential? Or is something being said that isn't true? And then I will tell you who said it. Uh, I cannot... There are things you might be required to do by law. For instance, uh, you would be, you might, you're required to uh, uh, sign up for the draft. Uh, but I cannot think of anything that you are required to do constitutionally. You are not required to vote. You have the right to vote, but you're not required to vote. Um, the only place that I would see such a demand actually is in the Constitution of the State of New Hampshire, which says, um, Part 1, Article 12, that uh, each, I'm going to have to do this off the top of my head so it might not be but said. But you may paraphrase. Perfect. Uh, each each uh, subject has a right to be protected in the enjoyment of their life, liberty, and prop property. Therefore, they owe their share of the expense of that protection. 
So that would be a duty imposed by a constitution, but that's not in the federal constitution. So is this snippet that I just read to you, and I'll read it to you once more. Our constitution reflects the values we cherish as a people and the ideals we strive for as a society. It secures the privileges we enjoy as citizens, but also demands participation, responsibility, and services to our country and to one another. So in its entirety, true makes nothing, you know, not one side or the other, or is it false? In its entirety, I would have to, I guess, say false, because I, again, I can't think of a demand that the Constitution for the United States makes on any individual. Okay. Our president said that this week. That doesn't surprise me. Any thoughts about that? That our president would not get this right? Because um, it certainly struck me when I first read it, when it was brought to my attention, and then I read through his whole declaration for the day, and I went, I can't believe this. This is sort of, from my standpoint, the same thing as where we have the freedom of expression, where he says freedom to worship. The, I understand the uh, origins of, the, of his philosophy. Uh, one of the things, having studied uh, justice, the, the purpose of the state of New Hampshire, and I'll be talking this on, about this probably on the first day of session. It's interesting. Do you remember the, the movie City Slickers? I do. Remember Curly? He says you have to find that one thing. Yes. New Hampshire has that one thing. In our first constitution, which also happens to be the, the first written constitution of a free state in the history of the world, that the state of New Hampshire was formed for the express and single purpose of protecting the lives and properties of the good people of this colony from the evil designs of wicked men, i.e. to punish injustice. That's it. That's why we exist as a state. Anything else we do, though it may be good, it may be efficacious, is secondary to that purpose. The problem is, is the definition of justice over the last 230 odd years has changed substantially. It used to mean two things. That virtue by which we give every man his due, contract law, known as commutative justice, semicolon, vindicative retribution, punishment, criminal justice. Over the past 200 years, we have introduced some other concepts, most notably social justice and distributive justice. And these are not just mere phrases. I mean, this, this is in Black's Law Dictionary. If you look at a contemporary dictionary of the English language, these, these terms are there. Distributive justice, well, social justice is what the individual owes the state. Distributive justice is what the state owes the individual. And at that point, we cease to have a limited government. That is correct. So if you're looking at the president's words, that which the uh, is... Um, he, he phrases as um, duties that are owed the state, that would be social justice. So, and, and we know from his previous speeches that he is a supporter of the concept of social justice. But social justice per se, which is usually phrased as an economic duty to the state, uh, doesn't exist, certainly does not exist in the federal constitution because the federal constitution was not intended to act inside of the states. Well, it certainly explains his propensity to demonize those companies that wish to move themselves offshore away from our, I would say, overly high corporate tax onerous? rates. Onerous. Onerous, yes. Uh, tax rates uh, via the mechanism of tax inversion, where he is very upset, and a lot of other Democrats are as well, because it denies the Treasury those 
billions of dollars. It's amazing when you chase people away, they run. Uh, yes. Yes, I can think of several other ways, including yesterday at the NHGOP party, where some of that became absolutely crystal clear as well. But I digress. But anyways, um, okay, you've answered that. But the other thing that you held up to remind me is that you have a new book out. I do, and it's actually published and available. You can purchase it uh, at Amazon.com, either Kindle version or uh, print version. And it is called? States Have Powers. The powers of the people. And it certainly seems to be a subject that is coming to the fore lately as we see Obama and especially a lot of the regulatory agencies pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to basically make the states nothing more than a subdivision of the federal government, the exact opposite of how this country was founded. So what is the main theme of your book? The main, the main theme of my book is actually, it's, it's to me, actually hard to articulate. But the best way to, to express it is if you ask an American who is in charge of the government or is supposed to be in charge of the government, most of them are, the best answer you'll get, most, most will look at you and say, they'll, they'll say the people. And I say, how do you know that? And they'll kind of look off into the distance. They don't really know if you, if you Generally, if you have somebody who has a, a good idea, they'll say, well, the Constitution says, we the people. And in a sense, they're right. But that, we the people, is a summation of 50 years of political development and um, 150 years or more of religious development. Correct. And I've and I'm trying to, uh, yeah, here it is. I have uh, a post up from yesterday. And when you have no clue as to your history, and this was done by uh, a, a group, and while, let's see, just go to the whole thing. And I was aghast at this in, in a couple of ways, but not so much in others. While more than a third of respondents, 36% could name all three branches of government, just as many, 35%, could not name a single branch of government. Over a quarter of Americans know it takes a two-thirds vote of the House and Senate to override a presidential veto, but only 27%? And one in five Americans incorrectly thinks that a five to four Supreme Court decision is sent back to Congress for reconsideration. <laughs> Um, this is scary stuff, and this was uh, done by the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I mean, this is really scary because it really, what it really says is that if you have no sense of our history, then anything is possible. It mirrors that old phrase, if you believe in nothing, you're, you're able to believe in anything. And in this time when we see people trying to yank the, the proper role of government, one of my favorite questions, into an area where it shouldn't be as you just talked about, on this day here in, in Concord where we're celebrating Constitution Day, how do we fix this? The, that is what my book is about. I mean, that, that literally is what my book is about. The first thing is the people have to understand their proper juxtaposition to their governments and of their governments to each other. And that's a given, but how do we get them interested in learning that history? Those of us who are active in the political sphere get that part. Either we are trying to reestablish that or some on the other side of the aisle are actively trying to destroy that. I understand that, but you've seen me speak. Oh right? yes. Okay. When you start to really teach people and they really start to understand that they're in the driver's seat, they get excited when they realize they are at the helm. And that's the importance of the book is I, I give them the fundamental understanding uh, from first principles, uh, from the starting with the state constitution, and remember the state constitutions came before the federal constitution, mm -hmm. um, and in, in large part the federal constitution would de derived its uh, structure from the state constitutions. 
when when they understand that the purpose one of the purposes of the state governments is to give them a tool that is of comparable leverage to the federal government and, you know you, you don't you don't charge a Mack truck and a Volkswagen. It's just, it's just a very bad idea. However, you might charge a Mack truck with 50 panel vans. Okay. Okay. The, the, you, you're dealing with an instrument that is of, of comparable, uh, comparable power. You look at what the founders, how the founders looked at the governments. Um, if you said to somebody today, should the states ever, is, is there any way that the founders thought about the states being at war with the federal government? What would it is It was a possibility back then. That is something that they thought because they were afraid of an overly strong Not government. only did they think about it, but Hamilton, now you know who, who Alexander Hamilton is. Yes, he was the, the one who wanted an activist government. The highest of high Federalists, right? Yes. Okay. In Federalist Paper 29, I believe, he lays out the battle plan for the states against the federal government. And people don't understand this history. So this was part of, one of the reasons that the states were to have militias was to hold the federal government in check. Madison in Federalist Paper 44, I think, it's in the 40s, um, goes into great detail how because you ha the states have militias which are comprised with a whole body of the people, um, well armed, that and, and because the, uh, a government can only maintain a standing army equal to about one or two percent of its population, which if you look at today, it's still true, the federal government would never be able to mount a force able to surmount that of the states combined. Correct. Now, outside of an armed insurrection, in today's environment, what is it that the states could do to do that pushback on an overly reaching federal well, government. Going to arms is always the last, the last resort, resort of anything. But it's interesting that our founders included it as a possibility in their writings about why the federal government was, was not going to be dangerous. Uh, but beyond that, the, you, you resort to politics first. And the first tool in politics relative to an overreaching federal government is to say no. If the federal government is overreaching, it is because they are exercising a power that they don't have. If they are exercising a power that they don't have, then it is not a lawful law. Oh, one would hope. That no, no, it is, no. It it would, it, the, the problem that we see from a pragmatic standpoint or from a business as usual standpoint, we don't see that happening. I understand what, what the, the, the legal ramification or the philosophical ramification of that, but I'm looking more for... The, the question, you see, people like to hide behind the, the supremacy clause. The Constitution, laws pursuant to it in all treaties are the supreme law of the land. But look, diagram that sentence, the Constitution and laws pursuant to it. If a law is passed by Congress that is not pursuant to the Constitution of the United States, is it part of the supreme law of the land? Well, that is where the, we could say a lot of things but, have but, gone by the wayside. But, it, but, but what is truth? Truth is that if it is not pursuant to the Constitution, it is, does not comprise part of the supreme law of the land. That's just, that's just what the Constitution says. I, I, now, and you know, I agree with you, Dan. Now, once, once, once you get to that point, once you're willing to accept that paradigm, each state legislature, we had, we had a debate on this on, on the internet the other night, each state legislator, legislature has a duty to stand between their people 
and unconstitutional laws. That's, it's, it's just... But they're not doing it. Ah, but who's in charge of the state government? That's true. The people. So that's the importance of the book. And we go, well, excellent point, because I was about to say, and the problem is, is because people aren't paying attention, as I read to you in that study that was done. If people and we come back to my original question. We can talk about the philosophy and the legal ramifications and the constitutional principles all day and all night long. But again, the question still stands. How do we get people, can we get people, the adults, the electorate in this country, to go back to their roots and say, this stuff is important for us and our families. You put the book out, you're doing your share. We try to do the same thing at Granite Rocks. But the question well, comes up, how do you get from that 3% that seems to pay attention to even 5, 7, 10%? At the beginning of last term, and I'm talking 2011, I was, we were in session, I was meandering around the back of the hall contemplating something, I don't know what anymore, it doesn't matter. And another legislator came up to me and said, what will it take to establish liberty, reestablish liberty or establish liberty? And without missing a beat, I said, tyranny. Understood, and understood why. Because I will tell you I have a whole page progresses in the proper role of government. And most of the Democrats, and I, and I you know, it's, it's out there on that page, they don't care about the Constitution. They don't care about liberty. And these are the people that have been elected. They care about power. They care about power. They care, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, one of the phrases that is there is, the purpose of government is to legislate behavior. That is not liberty, that is tyranny. But they're open, that was said by a Democrat. We have a, I have a Republican record that says, the Constitution is only a guideline, which means it's not the fundamental. I, I remember a, con a Republican who said that from the well during the 2011-2012 term. Yes. And that's the kind of thing that I look at and go, have we already been fundamentally transformed by the ignorance of our own people? Short answer, yes. What did Andrew Tyler, uh, Andrew Tyler say? I'm not sure where you're going with that, so go, go ahead and then we're gonna draw Again, this to, to a close. I must paraphrase, because I can't do it off the top of my head quite perfectly. But democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only last until the majority yes. understand how to vote themselves a largesse out of the public treasury. Yes. From that point on, they always vote for the, those who promise them the most for the treasury. Yeah, and that has been attributed to a number of different people, but he among them. Well, he had 1778. That's pretty early. Yes. Uh, they, uh, uh, let's see, it continues uh, with the result that democracies always fall apart over loose fiscal policy and are always followed by a dictatorship. The average life of the world's greatest civilizations has been 200 years. We're beyond our expiration date. And, and, poss and possibly so. And civilizations go through the following cycle. From bondage to faith. From faith to great courage. From great courage to liberty. From liberty to abundance from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependency, from dependency back to bondage. The only question that arises is whether we can short circuit the system and ricochet off tyranny and go from dependency back to faith and liberty and courage and abundance. I, I wonder that too because if the knowledge is not there, people don't know. But and, that, and, and, and I might add that this was the subject of my unanimous consent 
on the last day of session, veto day, September 17th, a.k.a. Constitution Day. And it was the last political word in the legislature, in the House of Representatives of the state of New Hampshire. Nicely played. Mr. Dan Itzi, I want to say thank you very much for spending more than a few minutes with Granny Crock. I'm never short of words. <laughs> no, you are not. Thank you very much. Crock to